Welcome to a new series here on the Wars of Rebellion channel, based on my book, The Civil War Battles of Macon. After Stoneman's raid caught Macon off guard, Maconites did not take their security for granted, and prepared better defenses around the city for a potential next attack. In November, as Sherman set his army in motion to Savannah, Macon for the second time faced the specter of occupation and attack. On November 9, 1864, with Special Field Order No. 120, Major General William Tecumseh Sherman opened the march to the sea. He had divided his army into two wings. Major General Oliver O. Howard was in command of the right wing, or the Army of the Tennessee, which contained Major General Peter J. Oxterhouse's 15th Corps and Major General Frank Blair Jr.'s 17th Corps. Major General Henry W. Slocum took charge of the left, or the Army of Georgia which included Brigadier General Jefferson C. Davis's 14th Corps and Brigadier General Alphas S. Williams's 20th Corps. In addition, marching parallel to the infantry was a cavalry brigade under the command of Brigadier General Judson Kilpatrick. Kilpatrick and Howard's wing posed the greatest threat to Macon as the U.S. Army nearest the city on the Okmulgee. In the aftermath of the assault on Macon in July, local military leaders determined there was a need for better defensive preparations. General M. L. Smith, the chief engineer of the army, and Captain Edward Winston placed works all around the city, which by November were in a forward state of completion. The hope was that even a small force could hold these defenses and protect the city. By November 21st, 1864, Macon was ready for Sherman's arrival. Having reached Clinton, Kilpatrick had to defend the infantry against an assault by Wheeler's cavalry. On November 21st, Kilpatrick sent Colonel Smith D. Atkins 2nd Brigade, which included the 92nd Illinois Mounted Infantry, 3rd Indiana Cavalry, 9th Michigan Cavalry, 5th, 9th, and 10th Ohio Cavalry toward Macon to tear up the track of the Central of Georgia Railroad. As the units approached Walnut Creek, the tributary to the Okmulgee that Stoneman's man had crossed less than three months ago, the command set to work on their destructive task, maintaining a tight picket guard for protection. The 9th Michigan damaged the track near Griswold Station, including a train with 13 cars. They also destroyed the station and the pistol soap and cannel factories at the town. At the same time, the 3rd Kentucky, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Robert H. King, had advanced towards Macon, but it remained occupied with the destruction of the central of Georgia. The 92nd Illinois encountered the enemy along Walnut Creek. The regiment deployed along the railroad bridge, which Stoneman's man had damaged a few months ago. The man dismounted and on foot charged over the creek. The man belonged to Captain Becker and Hawks' command. Upon arriving on the battlefield, Lieutenant Colonel von Bushkirk had divided his troops, with some tearing up tracks and others engaging the enemy. The attack of Becker and Hawk was to relieve pressure from the attack by the 10th Ohio along the road to the north. The charge by the two companies was successful, in that Confederate forces withdrew into their entrenched position. However, the men quickly came under artillery fire, 
forcing them to withdraw. Without pressing their advantage, von Bischkirk ordered his man to withdraw. Having accomplished their objective, Kilpatrick had ordered them to damage, not get involved in a battle to capture Macon. Meanwhile, to silence the artillery fire to the north, the 10th Ohio Cavalry under Lieutenant Thomas Sanderson advanced along the Milledgeville Road towards the enemy battery. Atkins reported they crossed the creek in a most difficult place and charged in column of four up the road and were successful in gaining a momentary possession of the enemy's outer works and several pieces of artillery. The 10th Ohio had to cross about half a mile stretch of open ground to reach the enemy pieces. Sanderson's reported the regiment, in pursuance of orders, charged along the road, reached the enemy's guns, which were in a redoubt, completely blocking the road, there being only room for two horses to enter the works of rest. Once the men had reached the redoubt, they found the position supported by trenches and rifle pits filled with infantry. For a brief moment, the 10th Ohio had complete possession of the redoubt, was the enemy infantry stampeding and panic-stricken and were rapidly falling back. The man from Ohio quickly faced the second line of infantry, a force of older and sturdier troops, as well as the force approaching them from the woods on the left, where Dunlop Farm and another redoubt was located. Therefore the regiment withdrew in good order, covered by elements of the 92nd Illinois. After the failed charge, Kilpatrick's men withdrew back to Wallard Creek. Rebel forces were lucky. Kilpatrick's men did not push their advantage in the fight and took their orders to demonstrate and destroy Sirius. At nightfall, Kilpatrick's co entire command withdrew with the 92nd Illinois Mounted Infantry, performing rearguard duty on their way to Clinton, where the troops prepared for the next day's action. When Kilpatrick's cavalrymen appeared before Macon, ordered to demonstrate against the city, they encountered a more heavily fortified city but the lines of fortification lacked men. Nevertheless, with only a few dozen men charging, the few defenders could hold the line. Kilpatrick's men never pushed their advantage. They had no orders to capture Macon and no interest in taking it. Macon was saved again. 